Time for sex, the podcast. Cause sexuality is tough. And okay, sex just isn't good enough. No, time for, time for sex. Hello, everyone. Today, I really would like to talk about the state of sex education in the United States as we know it today. So I, th I think it's important. I, I think sex education is important, period. But I think it's important to talk about what is the state of sex education because it is so varied. And this is often where our sexual knowledge begins, not everybody has parents or caregivers that that give them solid foundation in, uh, in knowledge about their body. So for some people, this is the only information they ever get. And sometimes it's pretty limited. So I really want to talk about this. Uh, before I dive in, I actually got to do uh, sex education in my previous job. Um, where I was working with people who had committed sex offenses. And that often the, the information that they had was pretty limited and some of it was outright misinformation. So I, I came, became pretty passionate about how does, how, how does this look across our country? So I want to kind of jump into the research and jump into some resources and we're going to have a little fun along the way. All right. So what are we currently talking to kids about sex in schools? What are, what are we doing? Well, it actually really depends on what state you live in, um, which is to me fairly sad. I think all of our kids in every state, no matter where they are, they should have equal opportunity to get information and get education. So what does research say, say actually works? So overall, I'm, and I'm not here to debate or have a political debate or anything like that. I, I care about what does research say, what are people's experiences and things like that. So what do we, we know, something we know and what research has proven time and time again is that comprehensive sex education has been is effective. Now, what does comprehensive sex education mean? It means that it includes information about sexual anatomy. It includes information about HIV, STIs, how to use birth control. And it also now in, it includes what does it mean to have different sexual identities? And that's really important because we, because we have so many kids with so many different kinds of experiences in this world. So we need to touch every part of their education about their bodies, however it looks. And I think that's, I think overall it is so important for not even one kid to feel shame about this because oftentimes there, there comes a time in their life, whether it's from a parent, whether it's from a caregiver, whether it's from a peer, that they will encounter shame about their bodies. So I think that, that it's so important that this education is well-rounded and includes many, many facets. So evaluations generally of comprehensive sex education programs show that these programs help, help youth generally delay the onset of sexual activity. It reduces the frequency of sexual activity and reduces the number of sexual, sexual partners overall, increases condom use, increases con contraception use. Importantly, the science and research shows that youth who receive comprehensive sex education are not more likely, I'll say that again, not more likely to become sexually active. It's that old adage, like I used to hear when I was young, that if you showed someone something, they're more likely to do it. Oh, if you show them or talk about this thing, they're more likely to do it. That is not at all the case. They, they're they less sexually active. It, increase, it, it, it does not increase sexual activity or, ex, or experience negative sexual outcomes either. So 
Effective programs exist for youth for many, many racial, cultural, and socioeconomic backgrounds. And that is super important because kids need to be able to identify with the information they're receiving. It cannot just be about one group of people. So there's there, there has been a lot of research done, specifically the National Survey of Family Growth to deter they determined uh, they what they did was they tried to determine the impact of sexuality education on youth, sexual risk taking for young people's ages 15 to 19. They found that teens who received comprehensive sex education were 50% less likely to experience pregnancy than those who received as abstinence only education. Now, abstinence only education, for those of you who don't know, is when they teach uh, kids to not have sex. And that's the only option that they shouldn't have sex. And that's the best prevention from anything. And when I was a kid, I got a combination of these two things. So I got comprehensive plus abstinence only. So it was, here's all the things, here's all the things to prevent STIs. And here's how you prevent pregnancy. Here's the body. Uh, And by the way, kids don't have sex. Don't do that. It's wrong. That's the message we were given when I was young. So the research bears out that comprehensive, all of the pieces, giving giving kids all of the information is the best course of action. So uh, research, it looks like researcher Douglas Kirby from the National Campaign to End Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy examined studies of prevention programs, which had strong experimental design and used appropriate analysis. Two thirds of the 48 comprehensive sex education programs studied had positive effects. So 40% delayed sexual initiation, reduced the number of sexual partners, or increased condom or contraceptive use. 30% reduced the frequency of sex, including a return to abstinence, and 60% reduced unprotected sex. I think overall in, in, an, in our country, we are adults and are nervous about sex generally. So amplify that by 10 when they think about teenagers having sex. And that is, that is a very, very tough place to be. I I understand that caregivers and parents, all you want to do is protect your kids. All you want to do is create a space where your, your kids won't make choices that, that, they are not ready to experience the consequences for. I get it. I'm a parent myself. Here's the thing. Comprehensive sex, giving them all of the information is what is actually helpful to them. So uh, this information, some of the information I'm sharing with you is from Advocates for Youth. They're a really great nonprofit organization. And Uh, I'll make sure all of this information is in the show notes so that you can, if you're interested, take a look at it yourself. Um, So that's the same nonprofit uh, advocates for youth. They, they look, they looked at a whole lot of reviews. So they looked at, uh, they looked at reviews of sex education programs and they compile a list of programs that have been proven effective by rigorous evaluation. So 26 effective programs were identified, 23 of which included comprehensive sex education and at least one component of the program. The other programs were early childhood interventions of the 23 effective comprehensive sex education programs. 14 programs demonstrated a statistically significant delay in the timing of first sex. 13 programs showed statistically significant declines in teen pregnancy, HIV, and other STIs. 14 programs helped sexually active youth to increase their use of condoms. Nine programs demonstrated success at increasing use of contraception and other than condoms. So, and, and any other, so they're saying that that's, those programs showed increased use of things other than just the condoms. 13 programs showed reductions in the number of sex partners and or increased monogamy among program participants. 10 programs helped sexually active youth to reduce the incidence of unprotected sex. 
So basically helping, helping people engage in family planning and engage in having children when they're ready to have children, not necessarily when they're unready to have children when they're young. So all of that being said, I just threw a lot of numbers at you. The bottom basement point is that comprehensive sex education has been proven effective and it is what every kid in every state deserves. They deserve to ha- they deserve to have all of the information in front of them. They in- they deserve to be able to make the best choice they can possibly make and the safest choice they can possibly make. And when they have all the information, it appears that that's what they do. So there is also some argument that abstinence only program can can actually cause harm. So there was they the the same program that, or the nonprofit, pardon me, uh, advocates for youth also looked at the research uh, that looked at only the abstinence only programs. So it looks they they talk about it says a congressionally mandated study of four popular abstinence only programs by Mathematica found that they were entirely ineffective. Students who participated in the programs were no more likely to abstain from sex than other students. Evaluations of publicly funded abstinence only programs in at least 13 states have shown no positive changes in sexual behaviors over time. I'll say that again. <laughs> 13 states have shown no positive changes in sexual behaviors over time. That's, that is a big deal. Oftentimes, uh, what will happen is that people want to legislate based on fear and whatever concern that they have of something that might happen, when in reality when people have the most information and the best education, they're more likely to make positive life decisions. So all of that being said, I I do want to bring this home a little bit here, here in uh, Eastern Washington, here in Spokane, there's been a debate about adding a comprehensive sex ed program to our schools and change how it looks. And uh, this program that they're looking at, they've actually delayed the implementation of it. So this program, it was developed by Planned Parenthood. So of course, then it becomes political. Uh, They, this program uh, focuses on creating a safe space to be able to talk about not only this the scary potentially scary biological things but also talking about people's identities and how to be accepting of people who who have different issues than them the curriculum teaches about lgbtq issues and terminal terminology which is part of the washington state sex education requirements so they've actually put this on hold in spite of having lots of um lots of opinion from lots of different people and and ha- even though that sex education curriculum meets all of the state requirements they're still holding off um, it, it, it sounds like yet again, fear there. It, it sounds like being afraid of what might happen if, if a kid has all of the information, it come that, that fear of what are they going to do with it comes up. We have a lot of research that shows that what they're going to do with it is actually have less sex. And if they're going to have sex, they're going to do it safely. That is what I care about. As a parent, that's one of the biggest things I care about. That if someday when my children are old enough to make those decisions, that they do it safely and they do it in the most educated way that they know. And, you know, my kids will probably roll their eyes every time they hear about sex because they'll be like, mom, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear any more about sex. So it's so, it's so very important to take a step back and try and look at 
the why of of how the why of the fear that you have about sex and specifically the fear you have about your children knowing about sex knowing about their bodies knowing about healthy sexual development which can look different for different people and they should know that because once they come up uh, come up to problems or come up to complications or they have a health problem I, what my hope is, is that they go, oh, wait, this is different. This isn't what I'm used to. I need to go to the doctor. I need to make sure that I get the care I need, not, oh, I should be ashamed and let me put this off. So that, to me, that, that brings us to why comprehensive sex education is important. Why do we need it? We need to help people and kids feel that their bodies and the things they experience are normal. And so they also understand what it is when things are not what is typical or if someone is harming them. We need to reduce shame to help protect our children so that they do know that if something is happening to their body, they can go to their trusted adult and say, hey, something is happening to my body and I don't know what to do. We need to normalize this so that children have the opportunity to get help they need if they ever need it. So I do want to talk a little bit about um, the Colorado study because there's some really amazing things that have come from the, uh, the LARC initiative. So I'm getting this information from the Department of Public Health and Environment from Col- Colorado's, the statistics that they keep track of since this program uh, went into effect. So their, this family planning initiative came from a uh, foundation from uh, Warren Buffett's late wife. So they created this this foundation and Colorado used this money to create opportunities for access to long acting reversible contraception or LARC. And the Colorado family planning initiative drove a 50% reduction in teen births and abortions. They avoided nearly $70 million in public assistance costs and empowered thousands of young women to make their own choices on when to start a family. So that private donor's investment, which I talked about, in the state health department's family planning program allowed that the state of Colorado to train healthcare providers and support family planning clinics and remove the financial barriers to women choosing the safest, most effective form of contraceptive. So typically what they would use is an IUD. So that is an interuterine device. They are long-term birth control options. They have various types of them and they have various types of them for young people. Now, I think these numbers are incredible. Thanks in part to the Colorado Family Planning Initiative, the teen birth rate was nearly cut in half. Teen abortion rate was also nearly cut in half. And births to women without a high school education fell by 38%. Second and higher order births to teens were cut by 57%. Birth rate among women ages 20 to 24 cut by 20%. Average age, excuse me, average age of first birth increased by 1.2 years among all women. Rapid repeat births declined by 12% and costs avoided this, this, these numbers are they just blow me away. Costs avoided 66.1 to 69.6 million dollars. That is so much money saved by the Colorado state government. Now, it, it sucks to put human experience in dollars and cents, but that's a huge amount of money and opportunities for 
families and and young women to be able to accomplish the goals that they were meant to accomplish, like getting a high school education. That is such a huge deal. I think it's important to to think about what what could that what what could that do if we were to enact something like that and give access to that across the country to many many young women what what could that do what kind of futures could they build what what kind of opportunities would they have to take advantage of so this this was also pretty amazing for every dollar spent on that initiative the state saved 5 point so $5.85 over the next three years reduced family benefits and assistance payments. So basically, for every dollar they already spent that they invested, they saved $5.85. That's insane. That's wonderful. It's such a wonderful opportunity. I'm just gushing. I just I can't, can't even help myself. So again, I think the Colorado study is an excellent an excellent example of why we need good sex education, why we need good options and good access for all of the the teenagers in our country, not just some. So all of that being said, I'm going to ask you, have you been worried to talk to your kids about sex? Do you know where to begin? Do you know what to say when they ask those questions? Well, here's the thing. Let me help. I have created a checklist that has age-appropriate healthy sexual development that will help you kind of look at it as a whole picture and go, okay, this is where my kid is at. This is where they might ask questions about and how to prepare yourself. It's a, a free offer that I have for you that I think would at least get you started. So you can check that out at ericamiley.com. You can shoot me an email at erica, E-R-I-K-A, at ericamiley.com. Miley is M-I-L-E-Y. You can also check out my practice. I am taking new clients in the state of Washington for telemental health. If you don't know what that is, um, that's video counseling and it's a online HIPAA compliant video platform. That's a lot of things for me to tell you, but if you're interested, get in contact with me at Erica at Erica Miley.com or Erica Miley.com. There's also going to be groups available. So please contact me also subscribe to this podcast, rate and review I would love to hear your feedback. I would love to hear the things that you want to talk about. So again, go to my website, ericamiley.com to get all of the information there. It's good to talk to all of you. Bye. Time for sex, the podcast. Because sexuality is tough. And okay, sex just isn't good enough, no. Time for, time for sex.